on Facebook. I got goes. the notification on my end showing where you are. Oh, that's good. That's a <laughs> that's a start. I never get that notification. I think you have Find to turn it on. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Let's see. You have to turn notifications on. Yeah, you're probably right. Let's see. Oh yeah, there we go. All right, I found it. All right. Oh, we turned the volume down on this. There we go. We get feedback. All right. Hey, how's the audio? Still working? Yeah, working strong and heavy. Okay. Well, we should have a couple others joining us, but you never know. Chris uh, said he would be joining us again, and then uh, maybe the guy from France was going to try. We've got young kids that tend to keep him busy, like a two-year-old and four-year-old. So he gets what I got. <laughs> yeah. And he's trying to put them to bed, I guess, about the time we're starting this or it's their nap time or something. So he said it's pretty difficult for them. And then I think there was one other, but we'll, uh, we'll start the discussion. Um, before we get into the rust, I told you guys I'd, I'd share a little update playing around with the Japan dryer, which uh, this stuff here, which is backwards in the image, I guess. Huh? Anyways. Um, so I, I, uh, mix that in with some Japani, put it on a plane, and uh, see if it would cure on its own without uh, without heat. And it continues to harden. Um, it was, here it is, soft enough to easily dent with my fingernail two or three days ago. It's been, uh, I think this is about day 13 since I put this on, if I recall, but it, you can still dent it, but not very easily now. You have to kind of press pretty hard on it. It's not tacky at all, so it's it's about ninety percent cured. So, which is better than I've ever seen this stuff cure without heat. So, I would say the Japan dryer is definitely making a difference. Um, looks like it's going to probably be a three week uh, dry just at room temperature, and it's been out here in the in my carriage house, which has been really in the low sixties. So, um, how that goes, but. Uh, no effect on finish. Once it is hard, I'll play around with, uh, you know, abrasion and, and make sure it bonded well to the metal, but it seems to be performing normally. And again, this was a incredibly thick coat. That's, that's one coat um, that's at least as thick as three normal coats. I put it on real heavy because I thought, well, it, it, we'll find out if it'll really cure or not. If it'll cure this, then it'll cure. So it's, it's working. Um, I don't know that, I don't know that I would, you know, quit curing with heat and go to that. Uh, you know, it's it's at best maybe a week or a two week, possibly a three week, three week process versus a couple hours in the oven. So, but for folks that don't have an oven or if you're doing like, if I was Japaning a, a, a shooting board plane or something like that that won't fit, might be an option. Um, I also talk, shooting. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when are you sending that out? <laughs> You'll have to talk to Chris after he inherits it. I was flipping through eBay yesterday and I found one. Guess how much they wanted for it? Uh, what about thirteen hundred? Twelve hundred, yeah. Twelve hundred, <laughs> yeah. I, I looked at Jim Bodie tools, and you know most of his have sold between twelve and fifteen hundred on there that were complete. And uh, so that seems to be kind of the market, although I'm sure it's softer right now. Nobody has, you know, cash to spend. But at any rate, didn't buy it to sell it, bought it to use it. Right. And uh, that was kind of the agreement when I bought it. From the, he didn't want to just see somebody flip it. And I said, no, I, all my planes are users. And I uh, I definitely do a lot of miters and stuff. So I, I, I have a shooting board that I made and that I run a, uh, a number six or seven. I can't remember what plane I use on it now, but um, this is great and fun. So and I couldn't, you know, it was a, maybe a good, good price on it. So at any rate, um, I also got to play around with this. Ah, uh, body food. Yeah. So uh, a gentleman uh, from Facebook had uh, a can of this that he'd had for a while. He'd never opened, sent it to me to play around with and compare to uh, the stuff that we're using, I can tell you my first impression when I opened it was I thought it needed to be stirred because it was like jello. I mean, you, you could turn the can upside down, nothing was falling out. 
I, I rested the can opener on top of the Japanning and it never sank. Oh, so it was it was very thick. Um, I went ahead and, and kind of dug down into it, and it was the same consistency all the way through. It's it's gelatinous, um, which uh, I went ahead and, and put some of that on a test plane right here, and I it, it it did not settle out the brush strokes. It definitely left brush strokes, and I worked really hard to try to get the brush marks out of that thick material, and uh, it would not flow out smooth. So I did thin it out um, with just some turpentine, get it down to a thinner consistency and applied it on this side. That's one coat. I thinned it too much. It was quite runny, um, but that it, it produced a very good initial coat. Um, so obviously it's you know probably this, the same ingredients that we're used to, the turpentine and asphalt. Um, so uh, it thinned just fine with turpentine. Um, Performance wise, I'll, I'll continue to build the coats up on here. I'll thin another small quantity of it, uh, but not get it quite so thin. Build it all up and uh, then do some testing to compare abrasion and all that. But uh, um, the one thing I can say, it, you know, I never played around with it because it's expensive. It's an enormous quantity of Japan ink to buy. I think it's about 85 bucks when you buy one of these um, from this place in uh, New York, Liberty on the Hudson that sells it. Uh, but I will say I've, I've, I've played around with all these different mixes to see if they're, how much particle matter is in them. And what I do is I spread the stuff out until it's just as thin as can be on a sheet of paper using a stick, um, a little stir stick. And any of the particles, you know, just kind of get drug along and, and become very obvious. This stuff is virtually particle free. It's 100% dissolved asphaltum. There's no... Um, debris, there's no matter in there that's not asphaltum. So uh, I would say in that regard, it is outperforming any mix that I've made so far, even though I've filtered my mixes. Um, it's, it's, they're either filtering it finer or they're dissolving the asphaltum through a filter into the turpentine. So nothing besides dissolved asphaltum is getting into the mix. So definitely it uh, inspired me to try harder on my own mix to get any of the particle matter out. Um, so that was that was the impressive piece. So I'll continue to play with it and let you guys know what I find out. Uh, I would I would prefer to be able to come up with a method for doing our own mixes that perform as well as that simply because of the price and the quantity. It's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit pricey. So. Any questions on that stuff? Greg, what does the um, linseed oil achieve in the mixture? What's the purpose of it? You know, it's my understanding that the linseed oil is what actually becomes the baked hard finish. It, it what it's what provides the the durability. Um, but I'd have to. I read about that somewhere. There's an article out there of some somebody wrote. It's almost like a master's thesis uh, on Japaning, going back to the original Japaning art in Japan, the latter art. And he discusses all aspects of it being used on early aircraft, on automobiles, everything. Um, and has a lot of, of information on mixtures that he somehow acquired that were written down from large industries. So he's got like a mix on how to do it, where it's like, you know, 500 pounds of asphaltum and three burlap bags put into a 55 gallon drum of turpentine and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's huge quantities. Um, but I believe it was in that article, he discussed a little bit of the chemistry of it. And uh, uh, if what I recall was the linseed oil is really what be, kind of becomes the finish. And the asphaltum is more the coloring agent. So I guess we could play around that by just uh, putting some linseed oil on a plane and baking it and see what kind of a durability you get. Um, I'm sure there's some interaction between the asphaltum that is better than just linseed oil, but uh, that, that's what I recall. So I'm going to kind of play around with that. In fact, I forgot to bring it out here. I did order a, cu a couple of uh, other uh, powdered uh, agents, one of which I believe was used in the Japaning on the Ohio Plains. If you know, some of the Ohio Plains are kind of a dark red maroon. Um, there was a, a mine in either Virginia or West Virginia that mined a, co a red coloring agent. Uh, I can't remember what it's called now. Uh, that I think might be the match to that color. So I found a supplier of it and bought some. And I'm going to make, make a batch of Japaning with that in lieu of the asphaltum. Um, 
it, it, I don't believe that agent will actually dissolve. So it's going to be a suspension of very extremely fine particle matter. Uh, so we'll see how that works out. But I'm going to play around with that red agent because I, I have a, a old Ohio plane that I'd like to uh, read Japan in the original Ohio red. Uh, so I'll play around with that. We'll learn a little bit about, you know, the interaction of the asphaltum and the linseed oil from that experiment. And then I also got some cobalt blue, which was a coloring agent that they used to use in some of the planes or some of the Japani, not what they used in planes. Uh, that's kind of for a special project I'm doing for a guy where uh, he wants a plane that's blue. So I've got a Stanley that I'm going to redo for him in blue. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. Again, that that ca it's cadmium blue. That is not dissolve in any of the solvents that we use. Uh, it only dissolves in nitric acid. So it'll be a suspension. We'll see how that performs. Hello, Raphael. Hello, how are you? We're doing good. We hadn't yet started talking about the rust. Uh, rust. I was just giving an update on uh, some of the playing around with the mixtures. Uh, okay. uh, and how that's going. So we'll, we'll get talking about rust here in a minute. So, uh, and I was talking about some of the different coloring agents. So we'll see what happens with that stuff. Uh, next week, uh, I'll probably have a test plane. I've got another sacrificial plane over here that I'm gonna clean up and I'll hopefully be spreading some of that red uh, uh, tinted Japaning on there. We'll see what happens. Now, I know the original red, I think at least was popular in Japaning was vermilion was a coloring agent that was used uh, when they were doing Japan lacquer work on furniture uh, here and in Europe. Uh, but that is a, uh, a mercury product that is incredibly toxic. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's not something I was gonna mention. I forget the feedback. Well, I have example, an example of a plane that I uh, restored from a friend that gave it to me. Yeah. It was really, it, it, it was the worst one that I ever repaired. Um, I forgot the, the type. Um, I think it's seven or eight, type eight. It was badly pitted on the sides. Anyways, uh -huh. talk about it later then. Very cool. Well, let's talk about rust because that was uh, that was what we were going to do was talk about how uh, how Ted manages to not have any rust show up in anywhere any on his property uh, in Guam and what simple <laughs> technique he had. I think it was uh, you know like some kind of magic pixie dust he used and and, uh, and it was going to solve all of our problems. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about magic pixie dust. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of elbow uh, grease. What's what's elbow the weather grease. like? What's the weather like in, in Guam? Uh, it's typically about eighty five degrees, and let's see, right now in my shop, with an aircon running, it's eighty degrees and sixty four percent humidity. Wow! Oh, this is five a.m. Five a.m. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! That's five a.m. Yeah. Okay. That's why you're. It gets worse. That's what makes you hair so curly, Ted. Yeah. That not seeing a barber in two months. Yeah. So yeah, so it does it is quite humid out here. Here's a rusty old plane. This is my doorstop. It's still the spring. Uh so this one I haven't done anything to yet. Not that showing up. All I see is Greg's table. There you go. There we go. Let me get it back to that view where I can see myself. Uh, I don't know. Let's ask our. All right, it looks like our tech support guy departed for a moment. Well, you, Greg, you you have your. I'm your, here. With you your screen. Maybe you should stop sharing your screen so somebody else can take over. Otherwise, your screen is the one that shows oh. up. Oh, okay. You're not seeing. You're not seeing that, Ted. Okay, let me see if I've got how to do that. Uh, let's see. How can I put Ted? That worked? Okay, there, there we go. go. There's my rusty doorstop. Okay. Uh, so, to help prevent stuff from getting like this, this is actually one that came from uh, Michael Jinx. This is the busted one. Oh, yeah. It's got a crack in the cheek there. 
Yeah, that's the one you're going to play around with, uh, brazing? Yep, yeah, this is my, my test piece for brazing. Right. So, I haven't yet. so a couple of things that I do to uh, help minimize the amount of rust. One, I've got a little enclosed shop. It's not very big. It's 12 and a half by 12 and a half feet square. Um, so I run a small air con, a little portable air conditioning. And typically when I'm not in it, I leave it in the dry mode. So it's dehumidifying the air and not really cool in the air. So that'll dro drop the humidity down a bit. And then all the other things um, that I have that I'm trying to keep from rusting, I put them in cabinets. So like most of my planes are in this little roll around right here. And inside it, what I'll do, has ever heard of Z-Rust? I have heard of it. Is that, is that a paper material? So there's several, they have several different products. Okay. The two that I use are these little capsules. You just throw this inside. So each drawer has one. Um, I got a couple of them in my gun cabinet too, so that my, my guns don't rust. Um, they also have a mat, this stuff here, little drawer liners. Okay. This is got whatever is in Z rust is impregnated in the in the mat, so all the drawers are lined with it um, to help minimize the rust activity. Uh, and then a couple other things that I do. I've also got some of these little desiccant packs. Okay. These I got I got from Woodpecker. Um, the only thing with them, I don't know if you can see the inside there. So normally it's blue. Now it's pink, right. which means it's saturated. You got to re. You can reuse these, but you got to reheat them. Put them in that the is, oven. Yeah, you put them in the oven, uh, three hundred degrees for three hours to reactivate them. Okay, I have uh, reactivated desiccant beads in the microwave, but obviously in that metal case you couldn't do that. Yeah, this wouldn't work there. Yeah, uh, this is actually similar to what we use on the ship to dry air. Right. Yeah, I've, that's. I've got a bunch of. I've got a uh, about a gallon and a half desiccant dryer on my compressor, and uh, so I'll change the beads out on that when they get saturated, which is in two years, and then just microwave them and use them again. That would take ten minutes here. Yeah, it takes about ten. Minutes. <laughs> yeah, ten minutes is saturated in there. Yeah. At least don't uh, It's the air. Like a like ocean air, it's also yes, right. you know carries like salt and, and it also yes. is bad to it rusts stuff like right away. Yes. Yeah. I uh, can almost throw a rock and hit the ocean. Wow. Yeah. When I leave the... my house, I get out from where all the other houses I I look out into the ocean. So. Okay. What's the we cost are... on the Z Rust products? Are they uh, are they um, pretty uh, uh, affordable products? I I, I can't yeah, remember. I can tell you. I can tell you what these little capsules. I think it was twenty bucks for four. Okay. Because I just bought just bought another set. I've, I've got like sixteen of them now because uh, I use them. Okay. And you you think that they uh, they they really help? You have one of those in each drawer and the drawer. Yeah, liner. absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, this one that I think I bought before twenty six bucks for four of them. Okay. They also make some little tabs, uh, little plastic tabs. I've got some buried in uh, plain socks, but uh, the uh, plastic tabs work as well. And they also make, I've got a bigger one that I also put in my gun cabinet that I got from the gun store. Okay. Uh, so that's just kind of like the, once I've got something kind of where it's restored to help keep the atmosphere, the control of the atmosphere. And then the other things that I do like after I get done working on something, um, I don't know how many of you guys do the fall sellers rag in a can trick with three in one oil, just light machine oil. There yep. you go. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Raphael's got it. So, a little three in one oil and, uh, and just soak the rag in a can. And this is an old bean, baked bean can. What are you, uh, Run that across the cheeks and the bed of the, of the sole of the plane, or uh, yeah, well, mostly the sole. 
that's what Paul Seller uses it for, and that's the reduced friction, what he does it for. But uh, okay, it also has the added benefit of um, coating the metal so that it's not exposed directly to the atmosphere. Yeah. I saw, and the other, I the last, yeah. I said I saw Paul's video on that, but I hadn't tried it. I was just concerned about what would happen with the oil. Uh, particularly on like a uh, smoother plane, getting into the work surface as I'm getting to the last stage of finishing, and then if it would affect uh, finishing the the wood, the you know, film, it would cause the any film, kind of discoloration. The film left by the 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 rag is so thin that that is kind of going to come off with the, the shavings that you take. Yeah. Even if it stains the the wood, it, it's going to come off. It, I never seen a mark left after it. And I, okay. I fill this with uh, three in one oil and also um, mineral oil. Okay. So it doesn't really leave a, a very uh, thick film. It's just very, very thin. Hmm. Yeah, Paul Seller says it's not going to affect the finish. Well, he would know better than I. He's been doing it for over 50 years. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> now, the other you, thing that I think was. You pull the cutter out or anything and rub that over the cutter, or you just count on the, uh, the drying uh, stuff you have to keep the cutter and the lever cap rust free. Uh, so the cover and the lever cap, that's what I use this stuff for. So there's a little, that's, that's the expensive stuff. This usually actually goes on uh, projects, Renaissance wax. But, oh, okay. Uh, Johnson's paste is the okay. other thing. Uh, you know, slather it on. Let it dry and buff it off. Yeah. That's for all the pieces that are not uh, not seeing contact with the wood. You can use that on the sole, too. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, we do the exact same thing. It's just perform providing that barrier between the atmosphere and the metal. Okay. Your whole goal in life, right, is to, to separate the two. Um, yep. I suppose even if, you know, rust is actually, once the initial coat, Rust is actually a rust preventative. Once it gets its initial coat down, as uh, long as there's no pitting, it prevents more rust. Yeah, it's interesting how some of the planes that I have or have acquired, some will have that that brown patina, which you know I guess is a, a light coating of rust, but it doesn't seem to be attacking the metal. Others will have you know that bright red where it's blistering and it's really it's pitting, it's active, you know, and it's just chewing it up. So I, I don't really understand the differences and how that happens. That's the different types of corrosion. There's multiple, multiple types of corrosion. Luckily, I had to learn about that stuff when I went through nuke school. <laughs> the one, you know, a couple different things that drive corrosion. Temperature is one of them. The higher the temperature, the faster the rust, uh, the corrosion occurs. Um, and then any film layers that are built up between it will, will change the rate. So, so if I just get a chest freezer and I keep all my planes in a chest freezer, I'll be okay. I would think so. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't drop one of them. Yeah, exactly. You're gonna end up with multiple little planes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And those are the things that I use out here. Um, it is really extremely humid. Um, so recently, I, I I don't own this place. We're actually looking at buying the place uh, after the. Uh, lease runs out for the rental, but uh, the air cons we have split ACs, yeah, that are outside, right? Like the condensers outside, um, the mounts for well, the mounts for one and the compressor inside it died, and then the other one, uh, the atmosphere actually ate the cooling fins off of the condenser. Wow, so that's hard, rusted. yeah. It rusted, you know, corroded through. I think it was made of aluminum. Wow. Yeah, it's five, six years, ten years sitting out in the weather, but it's still it ate it. That's amazing. It's that uh, anything made of metal here, so cool. Constant yeah. battle. Yeah, I think you definitely got the harshest environment, particularly being so close to the ocean and adding that marine component. I, I no doubt you're battling a much more difficult climate than I am. I complain about the humidity here in Northern Virginia, but uh, I, it's nowhere, nowhere close to what you've got. 
<laughs> but I, I'll see, you know, I'll, I'll, every now and then I'll catch something that just pops up and it's just rusting away. Uh, I've got air conditioning in my shop, but it's just a window unit. So I, I don't usually leave it on. It's on when I'm out here, unless it's really humid. But I'm getting ready to have a, a split installed. So I'll probably start. You know, it'll be so much more efficient. I can just let it let it run. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's my plan when we get to our, our forever home. Um, wherever I decide to put up my shop, if it's a garage or whatever like that, uh, I'm going to be sealing up the door and putting in a split AC. This, okay. split AC. This, this one works. This is kind of just a standard issue. LG. Oh, yeah. It works. It keeps it relatively comfortable between that and a fan. You know, as far as my comfort, it's usually okay. Yeah. Um, do anything out here really active. I'll still sweat, and it could be forty degrees out here, and I'll sweat because I'm just a fat, sweaty guy. Okay. But, uh, that keeps the keeps the humidity knocked down a bit. Um, the only drawback to it is it does have an exhaust that goes out the outside of the house here, uh, and it's actually an old dryer connection. Um, the, this was a washroom for some reason, which is kind of weird. Okay. This is actually outside the house. I'm like completely. I have to walk outside to get to it. Yeah. So it had some uh, uh, washing stuff in here, and I just took the exhaust as from it, put it into the dryer connection. So it's always sucking some air from the outside in. So I can only get so far down on the humidity. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else uh, play around with anything else, rust preventative wise? I've just started using Simple Green. And it's really? absolutely marvelous. As a preventative? Oh, sorry. Sorry for removing. I'm, oh, for removing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And that does a good job removing it, huh? It softens the paint up. Um, I use, I've use i used electrolysis and evaporous, but Simple Green just, and I leave it overnight in the bath. Yeah. Simple Green's just hands and heels above either of the other two. Now, does it remove the Japanning? I know Chris was looking for something to strip the remaining Japanning off a badly damaged plane. Yes, it removes the Japanning. That's why I'm using it, because I want to get rid oh. of the Japanning. Okay, I'll have to remember to message that to Chris, because he he's definitely been looking at different ways to do that. And, Simple um, green would, would remove it? I thought it's, it's kind of a mild, um, you know, perfect yeah, cleaner. Sorry, say that again? The, j Simple green? I thought it was just a general, mild general purpose cleaner. It is, but I've, you, you can out here in New Zealand, we can buy the Simple Green Concentrate in five litre um, yeah. bottles. And it's just so much cheaper than Evaporust. Wow. Okay, you put you... it on Sorry, we've crashed over each other. I mean, this is what I, what I have. Is this the same product that you're talking about? The one that Ted's showing? Yes, 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 it's Simple Green. Um, yeah, it looks watery. I mean, it's just the, the concentrate. Yeah, well, I, I've added water to this, but... Uh, yeah, I think Ted's, a... one's, Ted's showing the concentrate, which is the yeah, one you, you can dilute down with water, whereas okay. I think uh, Rafael's one might be already partially diluted. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good tip. Brian, and, you uh, put it on straight, you don't cut it at all? I, I put it straight into the bath, completely straight, no, no diluting. And I leave it overnight, and then I pull it out, run it under the tap, and it it will either come off either with a pick or with a wire brush. But it, it sort of it really softens it up, and it just makes it so the process of stripping it off so much easier. Wow, that's fantastic! You're saying it strips off the rust and or, or the japanning. Or both. Sorry, Rafael. Did, did you say it strips off the japanning or or rust and japanning? Sorry, um, I haven't really put a completely rusted plane into it yet. I've, I've got a, 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 I bought it an old um, size three that I wanted to strip down completely so I can do some testing with um, Japaning or, or spraying on, God help me, Rust-Oleum or something onto it. Um, I have used the electrolysis and the Evaporus for really, really rusty planes, um, but I haven't tried the Simple Green yet, but I've got a new 71 and a half coming in the next few days, so I'll shove that into the Simple Green and see how it works on the rust. Oh, very good. Look forward to hearing about that. Well, I have this, um, a few, uh, I don't do a lot of um, 
cool restoration. So I have only one gallon of Vaporas, but I use it to um, de-rust some blades. This has been here maybe four hours. I mean, it did a decent job still. Yeah. Sometimes I, I submerge things for as little as two hours and, and then um, use a metal brush to, uh, to clean it. And then I'm done. Did uh, any of you guys get a chance to look at that uh, video that I shared that where that guy did the testing of different rust preventatives on uh, chunks of cast iron? Yeah, I watched it. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. If I recall, kind of the conclusion in the end was that uh, plain old paste wax seemed to be uh, about as good as anything uh, and better than some. Yeah. Yeah, so that thing, uh, the WD-40 rust preventer, I think, was next, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I, I took to, uh, you know, I keep the paste wax around. I use it on the furniture anyway. So I've started using that on the, on the plane. And I haven't been disappointed. Um, but I don't think I've really put them in a real challenging environment. It's certainly, it's more work than the Paul Sellers, you know, uh, just rub the oil on there. I've, I've played around with other products. This is probably my go-to right here is a CRC 336. Mm -hmm. Um, pretty popular for, uh, woodworking tools. Uh, a lot of guys use around like their table saws and stuff. Um, so, it doesn't leave. Uh, it doesn't affect the finish of the wood, um, but it, it is a uh, you know it's a it's an oily feel on the on the plane. So uh, it seems to work very well, but it's um, it's a little messy. Uh, you know, you got to spray it on the plane. You get somewhat on the floor, and now you're walking around an ice rink. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't say is, uh, that I'm totally sold by it. Um, I I definitely use it on like corrugated planes when I have one that I'm working on. Or one that's badly pitted because it's very watery and it'll get down in those pits right away and peel those up so they don't get any worse. Uh, so I'll also use the, uh, the Bow Shield P9. Um, works works very well. It's uh, too pricey. Uh, if it, it, it doesn't outperform anything and it's twice as expensive as everything else. I've been using that on my table saw for quite a while, and uh, I'm just using up what I have left. Uh, I, I, again, it, I could use the paste wax and be better off, and you know, tenth the price. So that bow shield is it slip flickery too, uh, real slippery? Uh, no, it it it. Uh, you spray it on, uh, and then just wipe it around to get a good coating, and then it dries, um, and it's essentially, it's essentially invisible. Um, it, it actually is used somewhat on the table saws as a lubricant to help uh, the stock glide a little bit more on the surface, but it's also a rust preventative. I was going to say the paste wax will do that, make the surface nice and slick. Yeah, yeah. the bow shield leaves it slick, but it doesn't leave any, it's not moist at all. Once it, once you wipe it and it dries, it's, there's no film or anything you can tell. It, 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 it's like the paste wax at that point. So. But you know that can of paste wax will do what probably you know five grand worth of bow shield would cover. You know, so yeah, that paste wax goes a long way. It does. <laughs> yeah. Plus, yeah, I use it on the woodwork, so why not? I, I I looked it up one time on different rust prevention methods, and uh, um, one of one of the videos I I saw was some guy trying different different products, mm -hmm. and one that. One of his conclusions was the WD-40 is not a it's not a very durable uh, product, and in fact it dries up. So yeah, and it, it washes off as well. He, you know, he left that stuff out in the rain. And it does yeah. eventually wash. And then somebody off. somebody recommended this this product. Oh, fluid film. Yeah, I have uh, I have come across guys that use that uh -huh. um, on other. Uh, so much from like hand planes, but other uh, machines use yeah, that. And um, it's a strange kind of a goo, gooey product. Is it really? It kind of bubbles. Oh, look at that. What's it leave and, behind as a film? Is it uh, dry and? Uh... It doesn't dry. Oh, okay. It's an, an oily film that um, if you're going to not use the tool for a while, you just rub it with this and then. Uh, 
Um, over there. It's yeah, made I of, think uh, it's made of a uh, wool. It's lanolin. It's like lanolin. an organic product. Okay, yeah, it's got an odor to it, doesn't it? Yeah, it's got an odor to it. Yeah. It's sort of strong, but. Um, I think I read uh, where a couple of guys that have, uh, uh, not surfacers, I can't think of the name of the machine now, but you know, basically a, a, a metal machine, a manufacturing machine, they use that fluid film on those machines. Yeah. So it's I mean, really I don't know how, if it's uh, like, for example, I look, also looked up like a mineral oil, for example, if it dries up, it doesn't. So if you leave it, leave a film of that on a piece of metal. I don't know if that may be a, a rust. It might prevent rust, but I don't know how. Yeah. Long. I may play around with that. I've got a gallon of mineral oil. We use it on the uh, soapstone countertops. Mm -hmm. I might play around with that. I hadn't thought about it. Um, so. Now I have, uh, I have gone to extremes here. I'll show you one extreme. Let's see. How do I make this work? Uh, share screen. I mentioned this last time. When I'm gonna, when I finish a plane and I'm not gonna use it for a while, put it in storage. I vacuum seal it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, your basic roll of bag, and uh, draws all the air out. I'll throw a desiccant pack in there. Something like one of these little packages in there. Suck all the air out and vacuum seal it. And uh, I don't have to worry about it at all. But uh, you know, if I go to use the plane, I have to cut the bag open <laughs> and reseal it. So it's it's definitely you know I, I've done it like I have a tongue and grooving plane and a couple of circular planes that I, you know I, if I use them once a year, that would be rather miraculous. And so um, I keep them vacuum sealed. Um, I vacuum sealed some of my combination planes, but they're a little more difficult because they. Uh, have so many sharp edges on them, they'll, they'll rupture the seal. So they're a little bit more difficult to, to seal up. But uh, I'm gonna put one away for a long time and, and not really worry about checking on it. That's one thing that I've done. We got anything else to add? One of the other, I, mean, I think it's made of the same, it's got the same stuff. I do have, um, so you, you're talking about sealing something up for a period. I've got some of these bags too. And I think if you look at it, it's kind of yellow. How do I, how do I switch this? I can't oh, see myself. There you go. So this thing, I don't know if you can see, it's kind of yellowish. Yeah. So there's, there's something in this plastic bag and it's advertised as a rust preventative. I don't, and it might be made by the same company by Z Rust. Okay. <clears throat> like I've got a four and a half that I'm working on. That's the one I got to do the braze repair on. Yeah. And it's all stripped down. And while it's in that, while I'm in that intermediate state between, uh, you know, getting it re Japan and repaired, right. it's sitting in one of those bags that's inside my drawer with all the other yeah. stuff. Yeah, once you get it cleaned off, uh, before you get back to you know boiling it up and and japanning, yeah, you, you don't you don't want to see rust show up again because then you feel like you're starting all over. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As far as rust removal, I, I I've tried a couple different methods. Um, I'm gonna give that simple green a, a whirl too. I got a couple. Uh, I gotta build my oven first, but I got a number <laughs> seven that's in pretty bad shape, or a number eight that's in pretty bad shape. Um, but I did use uh, for the, I just did that Stanley four square. And that one yeah. was just enameled. Uh, that I just used regular old um, chemical stripper. Oh, okay. Cause it was, it was not Japan. It was enameled. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was just regular enamel. This stuff worked pretty well. Okay. Uh, even though I, I, I put it on, let it set. It says like 15 minutes, I think. Yeah. After a minute, 15 minutes, that's great. Uh, that didn't do it so it sat overnight with a pretty thick coat of it on there and then i came out the next day and it wiped off right. was that for removing was that for removing the rust or for the um japanning that was well it wasn't japan it was enamel it was just enamel paint oh okay 
Okay. So there's an old Stanley Four Square, which was the home edition, kind of the, the lower end, geared towards you know dad working on the weekend. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I took that stuff off. I haven't tried it out in Japan yet. <clears throat> we can do that. I've got a, a three and a four. I got uh, from Robert Porter that are in pretty bad shape. Maybe they'll do one of those that way. Then everything else, a lot of mechanical cleaning for us, right? That's the old wire mm -hmm. wheel. Yeah. Yep. Marvelous things. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And those little uh, the wire wheel and the like the little cone shaped one. Those are cheap. <laughs> okay. And right. Since I already had the sandblaster, I never really, you know, you know, got into trying to figure out how to remove the Japanning because that is, you know, about a 30 second to one minute operation. But you know, talking to folks like uh, uh, Sven over in uh, Norway, he doesn't have a blasting cabinet and, uh, you know, doesn't really have space for it. So he's trying to strip Japanning off a plane. It's like, wow, I really don't have any good advice for you. So I'll definitely share some of these ideas with him. I think you spoiled having a sandblaster. It's true, I am. <laughs> I looked at getting one. I can't find one, and no one will ship it here. I can, really? but the hundreds of dollars. Uh, you know, uh, I'll spend a couple hundred bucks. I'm okay with that. Isn't, I just there, can't get it. isn't there a product that is just the gun, a canister with a grid, and then it just you just blow it? And it, I have, have one cannon. of those. It's just, I mean, it would be portable. It would be for, not for a, a lot of... Uh, sessions but uh, if you're just doing a few tools that may be worth it i have one of those i picked it up when i was back uh for uh what i had to go back home for oh it was for a funeral so went to menards and they had one that you just shove into the bucket of media and attach to your uh, air compressor <clears throat> it makes a gigantic mess oh yeah oh yeah i can't <clears throat> i started to do it in my shop and oh no! I had put it in a box, right? I had a little cardboard box I'd cut out, put everything, trying to catch it. Or right, yeah. even can you use like a um, the sand from the beach? Yeah, that's uh, what I use. I use play sand. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not nearly as effective, and you got to be really careful because um, that sand, depending upon your air pressure, when it makes contact, it'll it'll basically explode. And it, it, it breaks into such fine particles, you're breathing in uh, silicone and you get uh, the silica, you'll get silicosis in your lungs. It's very, very bad. Yeah. So, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, you definitely want to be wearing a good quality respirator. I, you know, with my cabinet, my cabinet attaches to a, a, just a big shop back that's got a HEPA filter and I've got, I've got a cyclone pre filter on it. So most of, you know, not much sand gets sucked out. If I get the air pressure up too high, you'll see the sand just becoming va basically a vapor um that'll get out go through the cyclone and then get caught in a hepa filter but uh i mine's just a it's a harbor freight bench top sandblasting cabinet that i put on top of a wooden cabinet i think i think they're about 170 bucks usually you know and you can catch them on sale unfortunately i don't think i don't know if there's a harbor freight in guam apparently not no. yeah and uh you know they're not right off the shelf they're not that great um they leak sand like crazy but, you know, a, a caulking gun full of silicone seal, you can seal them right up and uh, um, away they go. And I've, I've, I've made a few mods over, uh, over time with it. Uh, I eventually got it to where it was running efficiently enough that uh, it, was, uh, it was stripping so fast that it was generating a pretty enormous static charge. And uh, it, would, it would discharge that through your <laughs> forearm where, where you're leaning on the glove inserts. And it's, it's like getting hit by a spark plug in your forearm. So I grounded the cabinet to stop that. And it, uh, but it works. It works well. Uh, my only complaint is that the uh, the safety film on the window, you know, it's a replaceable film, uh, clouds up pretty fast. If I try to film through it, I can film one plane, um, and by then, it, you know, I can still see what I'm doing, but you can't get any images out of there. And I've got to you know, put a new uh, layer of film on there, which is about an hour long job. Um, so I'm looking at modifying that so I can change it faster. Higher quality blast cabinets have better control of how the particles move around inside, where the vacuum outlets are and things like that. And they, they kind of keep the stuff from etching the, the uh, window. So, But uh, yeah, I'm pretty spoiled. So uh, I was going to show you, here's a, uh, 
here's a vacuum sealed plane. It's it's in a plain sock, you know, just so if that gets banged around, um, or it's in a gun sock, I guess, just to kind of a little bit of protection. And then it's just vacuum sealed. This is this is the number four. It's a, a very nice number four. I like to use, but uh, I don't get it out all that often. So I'm I'm willing to. Uh, that's that. You guys have probably seen pictures of that brass badged Craftsman plane. It's on my website and stuff. That's what that one is. It's just a real beauty. So I take extra good care of it. So, um, Ted, you had asked how I get the plane so shiny. Yeah. So I thought I'd, I'd share with you guys. What I do? A uh, beaver cap and uh, blade and chip breaker you put up. You can yeah. use that to cut your hair in. Yeah, it's it, it, you. You can. I, I've got a number of planes that. Uh, um, I, in fact, I have one that I did. I sold it to a guy. A collector uh, wanted it, and I, he got it for a bargain. But I, you know, I, I don't think I even paid anything for it. He gave me like forty bucks. I probably had four hundred hours of labor in it, but. I set it on top of my iPad with pictures of it before when I first got it all rusted and I laid it right up on, on the same image and it just reflected the image in the sole of the plane like a mirror and you couldn't tell which one was which so you can certainly polish them up mirror like if you want to see really good metal polishing uh, look on Facebook for axe collectors those guys yeah they turn these old axes that are rusted and pitted into absolute mirrors uh, and there's one guy who's done a little, uh, some videos on how he polishes them, although he doesn't give away all his secrets. But he's also a very good photographer, and he'll take these axes out in the forest and get pictures of these axes stuck in a block where the aspen trees are reflecting off of it, and it's like a work of art. But the big advantage they have is they have almost unlimited material to remove. So they start out with a grinding wheel, you know, and they grind off a considerable amount of material, and then they go to you know, a, a flapper disc, then they go through the various stages of polishing. So, which we can't do with a plane. You can't remove that kind of material on a plane. So, um, so it depends on kind of how bad it is when it starts, but I'll show you what, I, what I've what i used. Generally, uh, like on the cutting irons and the lever caps and stuff, I'll start out with a, 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 a brass uh, wheel on a uh, bench grinder uh, rather than a steel wheel. The brass just uh, seems to work as effective and it's a little easier on the, on the fingers, really. I, none of them really eat the steel. People have talked about that, but I, I, uh, I played around with that. I took an old plane and I tried to actually, you know, grind a hole in it with a wire wheel. And I finally okay. managed to make a dent in the uh, cheek of it, right on the edge of the cheek. But I, I almost wore a steel wheel trying to do it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but the brass wheel. The nice thing about the brass wheel is if you hit your finger on it, it doesn't hurt nearly as much as a wire, steel wheel. So. <laughs> It's a, little, it's a little finer gauge wires. So that's why I use it. But uh, so after I, I hit the brass, the stuff with the brass wheel to strip the rust off the lever cap, the chip breaker and the iron, really for probably 90% of the people out there at that point, you're going to be super happy with what you got. And you don't really, you're not going to go any further. It looks really good. Um, but if you really want to get stupid about it and just spend all your retired time polishing metal, um, this is what I do here. I've got a uh, PowerTech, about a 3,500 RPM polishing uh, heavy duty bench buffer. It's actually designed for, you know, running buffing wheels and, but you can put wire wheels on it. It works great. You've got full access, absolutely no safety. So you can get yourself in all kinds of trouble. Um, but uh, <laughs> use various uh, linen and treated linen wheels with various polishing compounds. Uh, as I started looking into this, I found out that most of the polishing compounds are silica based. And so a lot of these machines sit inside like glass cabinets and you wear respirators and you have HEPA filters and all that because it can be dangerous. But there's a line of uh, polishing compounds out there called Luxi, L-U-X-I. And I got there. See there. And they're, uh, they're water-based silica-free polishing compounds and they work fantastic. I mean, I've been absolutely thrilled with them. Uh, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, any dangerous uh, emissions from it. Um, it's Polishing is kind of messy. The wheels throw off little bits of this like wax material. I actually put this, this uh, polishing um, buffer in a large card cardboard box that I have just, you know, sits up on edge. So it's kind of like being in a blast cabinet, but it's open on the front. And just all the, the debris, uh, pieces of the wheel, the lint, everything just collects in the box. And I vacuum it out when I'm done. 
other than having it throw it all over the shop and all over the shop floor. But uh, so I use that along with these Luxy polishing compounds. Uh, these kind of run from most aggressive to least aggressive. A lot of them are designed for polishing gold and silver and platinum, but others, uh, you know, work on other types of metal like stainless and aluminum. Uh, the, the most coarse is the, the Asian blue. I, I have it. I don't use it very often. Typically after the brass wheel, I can start with this black compound and uh, takes about, uh, say, a, say a lever cap, polishing the front and sides of a lever cap, probably take uh, 10 minutes with the black compound to, uh, to get a pretty nice look, a pre pretty almost mirror surface on it. Um, and then I'll jump right down to the uh, red or the rouge compound down here and typically finish with that. And that will leave you with a, basically a mirror finish. Um, and upon what kind of surface imperfections you started with. And if you started with a good piece of metal, you'll have a mirror when you're done. Um, you can go higher than that. Uh, some of these other compounds really are for softer metals like gold and silver and wouldn't work very well. Um, but I, those bars are pretty good size. Here, I'll show you one. Uh, they're not terribly expensive. I think a bar of this is about $7. And uh, God lasts for, I don't know, 50, 50 hand planes maybe with one bar. So uh, I've got, I've probably done 20 or 30 hand planes and there's my bar of red still left, uh, probably more than half. So here's the black. So typically I'm just using the black and the red polish. Uh, I get those, I, I don't know who all sells Luxy, but uh, Real Grand Jewelers here in the States sells it. I'm sure there's other dealers out there that sell that stuff. Are you putting uh, that on pretty thick onto the wheel? Uh, not really. Uh, you know, you, you, when the wheel's running, you just touch it with that and you, you'll immediately see the color change. And as soon as you've got it on the wheel, you start buffing. If you get too much on your wheel, then you pretty much, you kind of end up with like a, like a, a, a waxy material yeah, on the blade and you're kind of chasing it around and eventually wiping it off of the rag. So, uh, you, you just touch it to the wheel for just a, a second and it, the wheel picks it up and then you buff. Uh, I probably do two you know, two square inches at a time you know about the half a plane blade and then i'll touch the wheel up with the compound again and do the other half flip the blade over um it gets really hot when you're buffing uh whether it's the plane body or the plane blades uh you can get hot enough to get yourself a pretty good second degree burn off of it so i wear a pair of leather shop gloves um i've played around with whether or not i was warping the bodies by buffing the soles because i'll push them up so I took a, a, a donor plane, lapped it really flat where I couldn't get a uh, 15 10 thousandths gauge underneath uh, my granite stone. And then I uh, put it on the buffing wheel and just abused the living daylights out of it in like one spot. Just tried to create the biggest heat differential I could. And I had it to where I was getting smoke off the buffing wheel. Uh, I think that the, uh, the polishing compound was just about to ignite. And uh, that plane was, it wasn't red hot, but it was scorching hot. Let it cool back down, put it back on the reference uh, block, and couldn't get the 15,000 gauge under it. So you're only getting up to maybe 220, 225 degrees, but in direct contact, that'll give you a second degree burn. And that's not enough heat to, uh, to really affect it. So I've, I'm, I'm not worried about it. I feel confident that the planes are in, in good shape afterwards, but it's not necessary. I do it because I like it. Um, I do feel like they, they rust maybe a little more slowly when there's no pits and places for the moisture to collect, but it's not enough to like keep you from having to use some kind of rust preventative anyway. So um, it's just the way I like to finish planes. So that's what I do. I saw a video I, when I was doing this rust prevention uh, searching on YouTube. Yeah. Someone reported that uh, he polished his um, I think he was it was his uh, table saw or uh, banzo, but he really polished the surface of it, and he claimed that that polished surface uh, would not rust as fast as a rough surface. Yeah, I, I think it's true. I don't think it'll rust as fast, but it'll still rust. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly if you get moisture on it. You know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it won't rust quite as fast. I had kind of hoped that maybe that would be almost a solution to rust that if I cut it really clean, you know, that it would be fine. But uh, 
I, I have had one pick up a spot of rust that was polished up really nice. So the nice thing was I just took it back over and touched it to the buffing wheel with the red compound on it, and it was a mirror again in about 20 seconds. Did you seconds. use the green, the green compound? Uh, the green compound is uh, low temp, so it's not for use with a, a high-speed wheel. Yeah. Uh, that's for hand polishing. I do use green compound when I lap um, the I hone a blade cutting edge. Yeah. yeah. But I don't use it on the wheel. It, uh, okay. It's it, yeah. But I don't know what the, the composition of this is. It's uh, made in China, but um, it was the green stuff. But uh, yeah. I saw you using the, the, the black and the, the white. Yeah, the black and the red mostly is what I use. Are they more? Are, are they fine or kind of medium abrasive? The black is is uh, listed as being uh, high aggression, whereas the blue is very high aggression. There are compounds that are even more aggressive than that, but they're silica based. Yeah. Um, there's one compound that I played with one time. It was silica based, so I had to get the respirator out. It off the buffing wheel, it would actually throw sparks. Yeah. So you know, it was very aggressive. Um, <laughs> It, it wasn't useful. One, was, one thing that I noticed when I was using some kind of a low quality uh, buffing wheel is that uh, it um, gives off um, fuzz. Yeah. And it can be really, really messy and, and it, like impregnate everything around you. So. Yeah, particularly when they're brand new, they'll do that as well. I've also got a, a, a buffing wheel cleaner, it's like okay. a really coarse rake that I use, you know, I use the saw. <laughs> Yeah, saw blade. And that, of course, that'll fuzz it up a little bit. And so that's why I put it in a cardboard box when I'm working. I've just got a, a box that sits on the bench. The yeah. buffing wheel sits in there. And so the fuzz and all that stuff just kind of gets thrown up against the back of the box and just stays yeah, in yeah. there. Yeah. So. Yep. So if you want, if you want to, uh, you know, get stupid about polishing metal, I just, I like, I like polishing metal. Can I say? Well, some, somebody, um, I bought this chisel not long ago. And when it came out of the package, that back surface yeah. was like a mirror yeah. finish. But yep. I mean, it looked it looked really nice. But I, what I realized is when I'm sharpening it, and then I, you know, remove the burr in the back, yeah, buff it, and I'm not gonna get that shine unless I'm going through like uh, all kinds of different compounds to uh, to get it back again. Yeah, so it's not, not something that can be maintained on a day to day. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the soles of my planes that I that I buffed to the mirror finish, uh, you know, after I'm using them on uh, really anything harder than pine, um, you will see evidence of use on it afterwards. But um, if I want to shine it back up again, all I have to do is go back to the wheel with the red compound and in about two minutes, it, it polishes it back up again. So it's just, you know, to each his own. Yeah. So my own experience with the rusting, if we go back to that, is I used I, I bought some evaporust and I used it for some tools that were really heavily rusted. Mm -hmm. Like um, so this friend of mine, uh, his parents moved moved, and they found a bunch of tools in their basement from their grandfather. Wow! He brought a box of them, and uh, the most um, interesting one was this this plane it's a five and a half oh yeah seven or something but it was so rusted so oh. one side was really pitted it's really pitted yeah i see that yeah and the other side not so bad okay bottom yeah pretty so i submerged this on evaporust mm -hmm. um most of the japaning is gone yeah um, so this would be a nice candidate for uh, refinishing. If yeah, I yeah. if I go um, that road, it's really nice. It has, still has a uh, rosewood handles, um, but that was the worst I've had. But it works. And yeah. then I there was this old um, ogre bit. Mm -hmm. It's very heavily pitted, and the evaporous took care of all of it. You know. Yeah. I think I, I ran it through the buffing, um, not the buffing wheel, the, the wire wheel too, but um, most of the rust is gone and it still works. I sharpened it. And, uh, really? 
Yeah, I was going to ask. I didn't think it would be worth be uh, be useless or useful anymore after that. But yeah, no, it still cuts. You can wow. see that there's a little bit of the spur left. Yeah, and it's a it's not a it's a different pattern than uh, like the, you know the Jennings. Pattern. Yeah, it's like yeah. Different. Oops. Yeah. Yep. So it came from that box. Some that box. So it still works. So someday I'll use it to. Drill holes on timber somewhere. On your on your hand tool workbench where your your bench dog holes are going to be bore them yeah, out with that, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know what the diameter of this thing is. Yeah. I think it's about an inch. Three quarters. Three quarters. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. There you go. That's uh, definitely dog hole size. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a good workbench. Yeah, I've got absolutely. the. Yeah, I've got plans to build one, but I don't have the space for a normal workbench. So I'm actually going to build a, uh, you know, a heavy laminated uh, hand tool workbench, but it's going to be a drop down on the back of my saw stop. I figure my, my saw stop's got three uh, cast extensions on it, plus a cast uh, router extension table on it. So it weighs about 900 pounds. So when I drop the casters out from under it with the foot pedal, it's pretty well anchored to the ground. So if I... <coughs> Attach my uh, hand tool bench to that. It's not going to move. Do you see my hand tool bench? Yeah, it's right here. <laughs> Let's see. What am I looking? At? Looks like a looks like an old crate. It's a pile of lumber. Yeah. <laughs> a pile of lumber. Yeah. Yeah. You'll see. Uh, you'll, if you see any of the pictures I ever post of me working on something, you'll see it clamped to the end of my table saw, which is not optimal height, nor is uh, uh, slipping and putting the hand uh, the hand plane blade into the table of the saw, a good plan. So, If you were a good workbench, have you looked at um, the Aussie Dave Stanton's bench? No, I haven't, no. Absolutely brilliant. Is it? Is it? Uh... C-A-N-T-O-N. And okay. it, you can put it on like a kitchen table. Oh, wow. I got to look at that. But he created this, I don't know, it's probably, is it, you know, it's like a sheet of um, four foot MDF. I mean, God, Dave will kill me for saying that. But it's got okay. holes drilled through it for bench dogs and clamps and whatever. And it's got a, flat, a piece that sits in front as well. And you could use it just for everything, everything and anything. An amazing tool. Wow. Can, you, can you write down in the chat? Yeah, I'll get uh, I'll get Chris to look that up. Dave Stanton. Stanton, S T A N T O N. I'm just trying to find the. I've got his. He, he does a live chat in another four hours, five hours my time, which is probably you guys would be in bed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be up. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant! It's brilliant. I mean, I've been watching him for the last year or so. It's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I'll try and find a. Uh, I'm just going to paste yeah. a link in the um, comments group, in the yeah. comments tab. Facebook if I Facebook click Facebook. on everyone and see the... This, is, this guy's in yeah. Australia? He's an Australian, yeah. He's just in um, Sydney or just out of Sydney, I think. Okay, I think I found a video. Yeah. Cool. cool. He's got dozens and dozens of videos online. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. If you want to, uh, if you want to be really inspired in building a workbench, you can look up a guy who lives in in the Dallas, Texas area named Mike Straza, S T R A Z Z A. S T. Uh, S T R A Z Z A. V -D -A. Mike Straza. Right. And uh, he is um, just an artist in wood, but he builds. Uh, he built a workbench for himself, and then like you know somebody saw it and bought it off him. So he built another one and somebody bought that and finally <laughs> people started coming to him and go, hey, would you build a workbench for me? And he still does woodworking as well, but he seems to be getting caught up in building these workbenches all the time. And he builds them for like professional um, violin makers, instrument makers and stuff. And they are, they're just absolute works of art. The the joinery and the inlay he does in them. I mean, they're not, they're, they're, they're used as a workbench. They're a big, heavy, you know, laminated top workbench and all, but Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. These things have got to be like twenty thousand dollar benches. Wow! But they're they're it'll inspire you. I'll tell you, it's they're just beautiful, just beautiful. You guys, so who who amongst you uh, have built their 
his uh, workbench already or is planning to? I, I built one and I used an old door is the top. Yeah. And I put four by four posts on the legs with casters. Okay. And yeah. then I used 18 mil ply for the bottom tray. And then I got another hunk of MDF, which was a, an MDF door. And it was about um, two inches thick. And I put that on oh. top of the tabletop. And it's a yeah. massive thing. It's in my garage. But I can wheel it around and move it. So uh, <laughs> when I clean the garage out, my wife will be able to put the car back in there. But we've got a two car garage. But it's just absolutely full of my tools and bits and pieces at the moment. Oh, this, is nice. a, this is a disease, this woodworking. <laughs> yes. and, and restoring planes is even worse. I mean, yeah. fantastic, a fantastic one, but... Yeah. Well, well you can always start uh, start collecting old saws, too. Oh, God. Yeah, we found, I found this... Uh, work, there's two workbenches on this um, basement. I found them when I bought the house. They left them here. They have particle board top and it's two by fours for the legs and aprons. But I want to build a heavy one. Yeah. Yeah, something that won't move. Here you go. You guys can always can always start on that hobby right there. Oh yeah, I did. I have done some of that. <laughs> yeah. A sawtail. Yeah, I'm. I, I actually. Uh, Working on a saw till now behind me. I don't know if you can see it. Well, it's kind of covered up. But over there, you can see that um, reddish door with glass in it. Yeah. There's two of those. Those are the doors to the saw till. Those are uh, those came out of the butler pantry on the house back in the 50s when the, the owners at the time remodeled. I think so. They're 130 years old. I modified those to be the appropriate height. And yeah. made uh, raised panels with my hand planes to yeah. fill in the bottom, and then right next to it, you see some uh, pretty knotted pine or fir. Those are uh, those came out of uh, main structural beams on a 125 year old home behind us that was remodeled. They uh, pulled the second floor out of it and put in uh, modern beams, and they pulled all the old wood beams out. And they, I asked the guy for them, and his workers brought them all over and put them in my backyard. So I've been uh, resawing those and and uh, building the uh, panels to make the sides of the uh, saw till. So when I'm all done, I'll have a 130 year old saw till. <laughs> this is mine. Let me see if I can show you. Oh yeah, it's plain till and oh, that's a big saw till. Oh yeah, it's pretty good size. And it's full already. So these guys are work on a little bit. These are all, um, all rusted they need to be worked on yeah um, this is a piece of wood my dad cut and shaped you see i don't know uh, oh yeah this, this part yep so he shaped, he he built a, a bunch of adirondack chairs for me many years ago and this was a part of it, but he made a mistake measuring. He made it too small. So uh, I was left with these pieces, so I reused it. Very nice. So it reminds me of him. So yeah, that's that's the key. Yeah. And Very I nice. was I was training myself to make dovetail joints. That that's where this box came from. Just okay for practice. But uh, I need a bigger saw the rust off. How do you clean the rust off the saw blades? How do I remove it? Yeah. yeah. I've used well, what I have, I'm just I'm just getting started in messing around with saws and uh, so I'm not an authority. But from what I've, I've I'm on one of the uh, saw anti saw collector sites on Facebook and the general consensus seems to be to use a new razor blade, a single edge razor blade and just scrape the rust off with that. And then follow that up with um, a, uh, like a, 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 a semi-abrasive uh, like dish scrubbing type pad uh, or, or 400 grit sandpaper. Um, but they're very gentle with them. Otherwise, you can take the uh, etchings right off the saws. To, to, to not damage the etching, actually, if you put your sandpaper on a, a block of wood. Yeah. So that... Um, 
flatness uh, just abrades uh, the surface of the metal uniformly. So it leaves the, the um, whatever's left of the etching in place. This, yeah. I, I, I did this with vinegar, I think. And then I um, ah. use sandpaper. But you can't put it in a bath though, can you? I'm sorry? Well, do you put it in a bath in a container yeah. and soak yes. it? I had a like a, a, a big plastic lid, which was maybe a, an inch high. So uh, I okay, filled okay, it up yeah, with, yeah. The, with vinegar and uh -huh. uh, submerged the, the plate in it. Um, yeah. It it leaves a it, it leaves a like a, a gray surface to it, so you have to polish it to get rid of it, or like yeah, like this. That was before I was using I bought evaporast, so but it's it's never gonna be polished like what you what your uh, planes look like. No, no, you'd have to remove way too much material to do that on these old saws. I'll show you one that I actually restored. Um, just fooling around. It, again, it's not anything valuable. It's not a distant. It's a old Fulton, but I like the Fulton tools. But uh, it's a little uh, linen saw or dovetail saw. It's not been sharpened yet, but uh, it's all original material. What I really was interested in playing around with is the etch was barely visible, um, but I was able to identify exactly which saw it was, and I thought, well, is it possible to restore the etch? And I found out that I've tried that too. There you go. See it? I've used uh, Gandhi. Yeah, I think it's picking it up on. Yeah, you can see it. So yeah. it's, it's only visible from the right angle. When you look straight at it, you don't see it. But when it's at a slight angle, you see the full edge. <clears throat> I can't see it. You saw I was able to pull the image out of the original catalogs and uh, and do that. I actually, from what I've read, the etching process on these old saws was probably kind of a lithographic process. Um, they were they were acid etched, but the image was uh, put on there with a projection type device. From what I've seen, yeah. uh, I actually re-etched that with the sandblaster. I created a mask of the original etch and then uh, sandblasted it back into the metal. So just playing around. Nice. I've tried to use yeah. this product. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, bleed. but it move, kind of a stain creates like a stain. It, it it restores the 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 etching a little bit, but not a really lot. Well. Yeah, not real well. I don't know if I have an example of uh, what I tried. Yeah, actually, it leaves out like a stain yeah. if you're not careful. I don't okay. think this did any. There's a little bit of the etching visible, but not much. Doesn't look that good. Well, we have been uh, flapping our gun here a little over an hour. And now we've diverged into saws, an area of which I don't think any of us have a whole lot of expertise. I can tell you I don't. <laughs> If we're going to talk saws, we're going to go over to the saw page and get some of those guys to come over here. Get Bob Page to come talk to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is he the guy that has the Loon Lake tool works? I think. Yeah, absolutely. That's that, that saw I showed you, that, that's from him. Yeah, he did the work on like that one. Now. With saws, from what I understand. Yeah. What got me started on the saws, I was at a, a tool meet. And uh, there was a, uh, I, I, the guy I sold that first plane to, that one that I really polished up real nice, we got to talking and he was telling me who his saw guy was. And it was a guy named Tom Laws. And he said, that, that's the, the, the maestro of saws in North America. This tool meet about, I don't know, two years ago. And I see this huge display of saws for sale, just boxes and boxes of them. And the person was so organized, they had like an index binder. And you could go through it alphabetically and it would tell you which box the saw was in that they were selling, you know, and, it, and the boxes were all built for transport. And so I was like, wow, I wonder if they have any Fulton saws because I'm, you know, it's crazy Fulton guy. And they had one. What kind of saw? 
boy. I think you locked up. You frozen on us. Oh. Dad's froze, Chris. Yep, <laughs> hang tight. Let me see what I can get. The remaining saws that he had done. Had done. One thing, one nope. thing that I'd like to get to is a ball saw or frame saw. Okay, looks like we're coming back. Sorry, guys, I lost my connection there. Oh yeah, you can build those. Yeah, there's a company that sells you a kit so you can make a, a frame saw uh, for resawing. Mm -hmm. Um. So that's. One in my to do list, not something that is high. Paul, Paul Sellers has a, uh, a little set of videos on how to build one. Oh, yeah, the small ones. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what are they called? Like, um, that's a uh, is that a frame saw or a yeah, I think that's you, twist, a, you twist yeah, uh, you got a little string in the middle, you tighten up the yeah. tension, the blade. Yeah, this one that they sell is about four feet long. And the blade goes in the middle, and it has two uh, arms, and there's under tension there, and that's the one used for uh, resawing. Mm. Sounds like a lot of work. Um, well, you mm -hmm. can. That's what they used to use to make um, veneer back in the day. Yeah, and then they came up with with a bandsaw. Yeah, the band. <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't, I have only a tiny band saw, but uh, for uh, we saw in lumber, I mean, yeah, it may be a workout, but <laughs> you're gonna have some buffed out arms when you're done. <laughs> um, the other thing that is interesting to to get into is uh, like the, those little uh, tiny um, dovetail saws, mm. um, or jet saws. I'm sorry, which ones? The jet saws. Jet saws? G E N T S. Jet saws. Oh, the jet saws, yeah. I have a couple of those. Like this. Yep, those little guys. Yeah, I'm not very good at it yet. It kind of like when I try to start, I get like a, it binds. So I think it has to do with the angle that, that you start the cut. This is a cheap one from Amazon. There's a couple of videos I know Paul Sellers talks about, you know, getting your thumb on there and actually just before it ever touches the wood, getting it moving. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another guy, Matt Estula, he's oh, a yeah. young kid from uh, England, but uh, he's got lots of little handy tricks and tips that he learned in his process of being a carpenter. I found this in a salvage store for like $5. Oh. This was my uh, experimental saw. The the plate was coming off of the the back. Ah. Uh, this was in really bad shape, so I really like sanded it and cleaned it. You guys it watch work? Rob Cosman's tool? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he has quite interesting articles on saws and whatever. Yeah, his saws that he makes are pricey too. Yeah, yeah, very much. Yeah, have you looked at? Uh... I don't know what you guys think, but I I think he's he will try to teach you something, but with the aim to sell you something. You know. Oh yeah, he's a businessman. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. I mean, he saw with a plastic handle is like two hundred and fifty dollars. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have you guys seen uh, Flow Flow Rip Eric Flow Rip saws? Yes. F L O R I P. Yes. Yeah, they're nice. He's a, uh, yeah, former uh, U.S. military member, I think. I, I think yeah. he might have been, you know, injured or something. And anyways, he uh, started playing around woodworking and decided he liked making the tools better and started making saws. And boy, they're beautiful and they're yeah, they're very they're nice. reasonably priced. Well, there's another one um, in England, Skelton. Um, Skelton is the name of the maker. Hmm. 
Not familiar. Um, they are like 500 pounds per saw. Oof. Wow. Um, $600. 600 yeah. No, $600 pounds or something to that effect. <laughs> That's probably even more. But they are really beautiful uh, saws. Yeah. Um, who else makes saws nowadays? Uh, um, Gramercy. Gramercy. Bad Axe. Tools. Bad Axe, yeah. Gramercy, yeah, Gramercy yeah, yeah. tools are the guys from uh, New York. Yeah. Greg, the, I've got a question. Really, I was going to say the problem with getting really good tools, it's like golf. If you get really good clubs, then you don't have an excuse anymore for why you're so bad. <laughs> Greg, can I ask you a question about my um, Japaning mixture? Sure, by all means. If I was to look, look at the bottle now and it's downstairs, there will be a quarter inch, eighth of an inch layer of linseed oil sitting on top of this brown, dark, dark brown, and it's like liquid chocolate. It is very, very thick. I kept adding asphalt and asphalt and asphalt, and now it's probably gone over the top. Do I thin it, add more turps to thin it down? If I stir, yeah, oh, sorry, head, yeah. sorry, when I say it's super thick, it, it, it's almost hard when I put my stick in, into it. But as soon as I start stirring it, it becomes liquid like milk again. Huh. So it's like it's like the, the BLO has is not mixing in, but it's forming a thick layer on top. It sits on top. Yeah. Until I stir it. And then I stir it all in and it becomes a, a nice ply. Well, it's a, it's a consistency of like milk. Thick or yeah. maybe cream, um, yeah. but if I leave it for an hour or two, it just it settles and it goes hard like chocolate. That, I I don't have any experience with anything like that. Ted, you kind of nodded like, no. I think the maybe more turpentine sounds like to me. If it's yeah. getting hard. You may have put too much asphalt in it, and, but I didn't have any problems with the the BLO separating out and forming a layer it all mixed right in and stayed mixed in yeah it is it's you know i stirred where's my batch ah, I yeah. it there it is you can see it's inside there i've added a couple of shots of turpentine to it when it got a little thick now it's kind of like nutella consistency Okay, I'll just keep playing. I'll try it again. I'll add some more turps. We'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, Ron, you're having the, uh, the most difficult time. <laughs> Very I, frustrating. I, I know. I feel for you. Um, yeah, I, uh, I just, I don't know what to tell you on that. Uh, I think no Ron, I think Ted's advice is pretty good. Is you know try to get the turpentine back in there and see if you can get it all to blend together. So, see where it goes from there. Did you dissolve your asphaltum first? Did I dissolve your asphaltum, just asphaltum and turpentine together? Uh, no, I think I just tipped in the, 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 the three in the jar all at once. You know, I can't remember what the mixture was, a third, a, a 40, 20, 20, but I did it by volume, not by weight with the asphaltum. Right. Okay. Um, and That's I think it was I like a, a little vial and it was like two ounces of as asphaltum and I can't remember the mixture. It was so long ago. Yeah. Does it yeah, make a difference? It. Does it make a difference if you mix by volume or or weight? Oh, I think it would definitely, because that asphaltum weighs virtually nothing. So I think you'd have, yeah, I think you'd end up with uh, a, an enormous amount of asphaltum more than would ever dissolve. Yeah. So I, I mixed mine by volume, and I think that's what that tool guy. Uh, what was his video? Yeah, tool rescue. And tool rescue, yeah, he did all of his by volume. Okay, sometimes that... it's obvious because um, those units of measure so it's, it can be both. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Rafael. I'd never really thought about that before, and so uh, you've convinced me. I'm going to go back to some of the articles I've written. I want to amend them to include in there that the volume, the the measures are by volume, because yeah, it'd be real easy to assume weight, real easy. Some of the links that the web post is from, from the first meeting, there was a, a link from somebody that, that had a recipe. Maybe the guy, um, the Civil War. Yeah. 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 His, his recipe was by weight, I believe. Yeah. Was it, was it Ted? Wow. 
It was, yeah. He gave the uh, ounce equivalent. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, maybe it would pay to uh, to be uh, specific. Yeah, that's a great point. I watched another dude. Um, he's some German guy, and you know he complains that his English is bad, but it's a hell of a lot better than my German. Um, and he had a book, had a couple books that he dug up from way back in the day from these German manufacturers that were Japanning stuff, and he was translating the recipes. And of course, you know it's all you know, 500 pounds of, of asphaltum in, you know, 45 gallons of, of uh, linseed oil or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then one of the other, one of the things that was in there was this stuff. Queen Bee's resin. Yeah, I have seen that. What is it? So, I'm going to try this. I, you know, I'm going to crush it up. It looks like Looks like rock candy. <laughs> it looks like to me. But you, you, do you know what it is? It's uh, some resin that came out of uh, the ones I saw came out of Malaysia. It's out of a it looks like gum out of a tree. Tree resin. Yeah. Damar resin. Damar. Like okay. Um, it from they uh, collect uh, tree resins to make a uh, like a. Uh, um aromatic uh you know like uh, incense uh what is it called um it's not amber it's uh something it's opal so yeah this is a tree resin yeah. i'm gonna smash some of it up mix it with some turpentine see what happens what you're gonna use mom's blender to chop it up no we won't do that. I actually uh, ordered this little tiny mortar and pestle for this. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was thinking the uh, the coffee grinder would do a nice job on it. <laughs> yeah, we're not. He, did he say what the purpose of that resin is for? Uh, he just had the recipes from these old companies that used to make this stuff. Um, okay. I can see it maybe making it maybe a little binder that holds everything together. Interesting. Yeah. So we'll see. Of the, uh, Throw some in there and bake it up and see what happens. Hopefully, it doesn't catch on fire. So this guy's online. Yeah, he was like, I can look it up and maybe throw it on the the Facebook page. Uh, I can't remember his name. Let's see if I can find him. So one of the guys on the Facebook page is commenting on it. He recognized it right away. Uh, Adamo. He said the Damar has been traditionally used by painters and luthiers as a varnish type finish. Okay, so it's probably gonna shine it up more. Perhaps. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Well, I look forward to your experiment with that. Yeah, we'll give that a whirl. Sounds good. Yeah, find this guy. Yeah, if you if you find it, share the link where you, where you got that stuff from, and then. Uh, Greg, in, in, your, in your research, you ha have you you haven't come across any documentation on, on what they what techniques they use for Japaning back in the day. As far as the planes go, no, no, no one uh, that I've spoken with, nor have I found any material that indicates how the big manufacturer has actually applied it. But the, the, the consensus from some of these guys out there that have been around hand planes for a long time, like uh, Don Willwall and Eva, I've even talked to Rob Porter, the union guy about it, is that they, they probably immersed them. They dipped them into the Japanning just because, you know, you got you, companies were making thousands and thousands of planes. And yeah. so it was all about, you know, you know, efficiency. So I figured that they were taking the castings and uh, maybe doing some very rough finishing on the casting. And then dipping them in the Japanning and then doing the machining of the final machine machine surfaces. Uh-huh. Which makes it makes sense. I mean, that's kind of kind of what they do with automobiles today, really. Like, you know, the, the where, frame. Where did, the, where did your Japanning tradition came from? Is it 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 France, England, or Germany or well, actual Japanning was a, a artist uh, lacquer work on wood in Japan. Yeah. And it was being imported into Europe on fine furniture and, and as art. 
And then uh, there was some fear that they were going to lose that importation. I don't know, something was happening in the world. Maybe there was some, you know, political battles. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, in Italy, my understanding is the uh, local artisans started experimenting around to try to find a way to reproduce it because they felt like there wasn't going to be a supply of these, these uh, pieces of furniture or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, so they came up with a technique there and then it spread throughout Europe and uh, it was in England that my understanding is, is where they started applying it to metal as a rust preventative. Yeah. And, uh, it was, a, a, you know, it, it, as the, um, Furniture finishing went in a different direction or the demand for it went away. The Japaning became popular on some of the cast iron products. There was a story in there about how the Sunbeam Bicycle Company started Japaning the bicycle frames to keep them from rusting. And the, the very reflective, glossy finish from the Japaning is why they named the company Sunbeam because it reflected the sunbeams. Mm -hmm. It was used, I know it was used on the, uh, in the automotive industry here in the States, the old uh, Model T's, Model uh, A's, the uh -huh. early Ford's. Uh, they were Japan. Across the street from where I work, um, there's an old building, and apparently it was a Ford uh, manufacturing plant back in the day. And yeah. the, the building where I work at um, was a showroom, and they have these old uh, um, elevators, like like freight elevators. They're gigantic. They're probably like a 20 by 50 feet long. Yeah. Got a couple interesting questions here. Uh, Adamo, the, the guy that knew about the, uh, the Damar varnish, uh, he was asking uh, what era did they start first applying the Japanian on the metal in England? I think if I read correctly, it was in the late 1700s, like 1780 maybe, is when they started playing, uh, they found some evidence of it being applied to tinware. It was used uh, on the, the tinware, almost like dishes or something maybe to waterproof buckets. Uh, being on cast iron, I think was actually in the mid 1800s is when it first showed up on cast iron product. Um, and then another hey, person- I, 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 found the, I found the German Jap, uh, Japanning guy. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm gonna send a link to your uh, messenger and maybe uh, Chris can throw it up on your webpage. Sure. Or on your page. Yeah, it'd be great. Can you post it on that on the group chat? Yeah, Chris will put it up on the Facebook uh, message. What is the, the Facebook link? I don't have it. Uh, if you search Facebook for a plain life, P-L-A-N-E life, that's where uh, we're live streaming that too. And the, so it, it gets recorded and you can go back and watch the video and all the comments are there as well. So, although I, I don't know if the comments run like real time with the video so you'd have to know where it was discussed or if you can just go down and read all the comments oh there is okay. you know? once the video is processed after the live stream is ended you can uh depending on the view you can either see all the comments that were shared or uh -huh. you have to know about the time frame and, and watch the whole video it just it kind of depends on how it processes that day okay um we'll take a look at it and and, and get all the references uh, in a re readily accessible format on there for you guys. So, uh, somebody asked if there was any uh, factory documentation about the Japan and how it was done and applied. And uh, no, to my knowledge, no one's ever found that documentation, which is shocking, particularly with like a big company like Stanley that's still in business today. But by the 1920s, when good quality enamel came out, they you know, gave up on the Japaning for a much faster, probably less laborious process. All that knowledge, left with the retirees and, uh, and uh, people. The yep. yeah, Stanley for a long time was really good about preserving their history. And then I, I didn't even realize this had happened. You know, they originally had a, uh, the original um, model of every plane they ever made. They had a model room and I've, there's a video tour online of a guy who got a tour of this model room and he's yeah, pulling the original number one. Here's the original number 55 and all that stuff. They sold all that out. Uh, a number of years ago, Stanley sold off all the models. Um, Rob Porter recently acquired one. And uh, so, yeah, Stanley is kind of like just, they, you know, they don't care about the history. And, you know, they're a company. History doesn't make money. Um, and they weren't doing tours yeah. of the museum. So I guess I can understand. Is that is that, that square, those squares he's got? Uh, no, he actually recently acquired a, uh, well, those squares may have something to do with that. He recently acquired a hand plane. Um, that uh, was in the Stanley model shop, although it's not a Stanley plane. 
it was actually, I think, a union plane that they think Stanley acquired to kind of like look at how could they work around the patents on it, which was a common practice. It's still today. Yeah, it's a common practice. And uh, this plane was signed by one of the two big patent guys from Stanley. It's got the guy's signature on it. And uh, apparently it's been verified as being most likely the real deal. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. I, I don't remember the gentleman's name. I wish I did. Rob Porter will kill me from the memory line. It wasn't Justice Trout, who was one of the big prolific um, patent guys for Stanley. There was another one, Shade, E.A. Schrade, I think is his name. Also has, you know, a whole bunch of the Stanley patents attributed to him. And uh, his signature's on that Union plane. It's pretty darn cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, guys, think of topics that you might want to talk about next week. Um, whatever you think. We can do a show and tell. We can do a drop test on a uh, on an old plane and see, you know, how easily they break. <laughs> I haven't I haven't broken one yet. I got rubber mats around most of my work areas. I but dropped my not, number. I dropped my number three the other day. Did it break? I have a, no, I have a rubber. Uh, oh. Uh, I dropped one yesterday on the concrete and it survived. <laughs> oh man, you're lucky. You're lucky. That's uh, that's my fear. You know, it's 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 bound to happen one day. I'll drop that would one be so soul destroying, especially after you spent hours and hours restoring a plane and then drop it. Oh God, I've, yeah, I've got a few that I don't know that I'd ever find another one like them. So the original, the, the, the first generation Fultons, and God, if I dropped one of those, I'd just sit down and cry. <laughs> and you have rubber. Yeah, one, I have no uh, no time invested in it. I just got it. And it was sitting on my toolbox, and I was uh, was vacuuming the floor and hit it with the hose. <sighs> Wow. Well, glad it survived. Picked it up. Oh. I'm like, yeah, you look good. <laughs> yeah. I've got one that I one that I restored a while back that uh, had the, the blade. Of course, the, 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 the lateral lever was bent. There was a dent in the top of the tote where, of course, it fell. The previous owner at some point, it fell and it landed right on top of the tote. So it drove the lateral lever into the tote you know, put a dent there and the lever was bent down, but it also hit the blade and the blade had a good bend over the top of the frog. So I, uh, I straightened it back out, but I wasn't sure, so sure how that was going to work. You know, if I could get it straight or if I'd break it or what would happen, but I did manage to straighten the blade out without using heat because I didn't want to mess around with the temper, but uh, you can sort of see exactly where it fell. Mm. Well, all sellers, in one of his videos, he shows how a way to, uh, Get rid of the belly of the blade by wiping yeah. the, the, the blade. I yeah. tried that and I uh, broke my uh, the one blade. Yeah, you put. I think you posted. I think I saw that posting where it split right down to the cutting edge from the slot. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and then I tried it again, and then I broke it again too. So oh. I broke too. So I'm, that's a, the the last time I'm gonna use that method. I'm just gonna use sandpaper now. Okay. Um, what kind of hammer are you hitting it with? Actually, I broke the blade for this plane trying to. Oh, the that's the five and a half. Yes. Oh, that's sad. And um, so I bought a blade. I think from Jim Body. Bodie, um, Jim, Jim Bodie, yes, I think Jim Bodie got it from him. Okay, um, did you get one from the same period as the plane? I believe line? so. Yeah, the one with the um, the V shape. Uh, oh, style. that's the night. That's the coolest Stanley logo of them all. I love that V logo. Can you yeah, that's yeah, one? yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, no, I was. I should have known better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It's, uh, it's a learning process. So. Yeah. Okay, Adoma wants the link to that video of the Stanley Model Shop tour. All right, I got to find that. Yeah, that'd be cool. I acquired a collection recently. Yeah. Yeah, I have to look for that video um, for that tour. It was a, it was a. a Kind of a commercial production. I think it was like almost like a PBS guy or somebody that got to go in there. And uh, of course, it just leaves a longing for more. I mean, he only shows like maybe uh, I don't know a dozen other things that are on the shelves in this upstairs attic at Stanley. I think I think that's what it was called, like Stanley's attic or something. I'll I'll search and uh, post the link. I think I saw that. it, but they they had the the 
all their planes in like in shelves and in um, not a dusty shelves. Um, some guy uh, picking them up and and, and displaying them, but um, yeah, I don't think they they. Uh, I thought they had a like a little museum kind of thing. Hmm. Because I There's remember the a display shelf showing in the, in the in the of some of the tools in the in that video. Oh, oh. They, yeah, they may somewhere in the factory. I actually went and visited New Britain and drove by the Stanley Works. There's an industrial museum there that has some Stanley stuff and a lot of other stuff in it, but it's really tiny. I was I was a little disappointed. I mean, it was cool. They had some unique stuff in there, but it was not what I was expecting in New Britain, Connecticut, with the history of that city. So. Um, Adamo says that the uh, that uh, Damar um, resin that you have is also available in liquid form. Oh, is it? Yeah, he posted a link to it. Grumbacher, which is a big artist supply company, he said Grumbacher sells it. He's posted the link to it. Oh. That uh, in Michael's craft stores. Yeah, yeah, it was in Michael's. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I, we'll see how, how it goes with your mortar and pestle. That just seems very authentic. But I'm gonna be beating the snot out of it. I also thought about using uh, like a some sort of something to grate it down. I was thinking like one of those zesters, these things you use to like get the lemon zest, kind of grind it up. Yeah, yeah. Microplane. Yeah, yeah right. Micro yeah, that's not a bad idea. How hard? Yeah, we'll okay. Yeah, see, I'm gonna hold this stuff here. Well, guys, we better we'll wrap. It. Otherwise, we'll go all day. Right. We're gonna talk about. Send me some topics for next week, and uh, we'll we'll pick one or two to to uh, you know get Ted out of bed at five a.m. again. Was it five four. or four in the morning? Four. Four thirty. I get up. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> it beats I'd your have, original time. I'd have a cup no, of coffee man. with you, but it's three in the afternoon here. It's a little late for me to be drinking coffee, Ted. Your original time, I think, was one in the afternoon. I'm like, mm, not gonna make yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know, it's, it's it's really interesting. Uh, this brings it back when I worked for the Federal Aviation Administration and did a lot of stuff that you know sometimes was international. Uh, that you know how, it, how difficult it can be to to work with folks in Guam or New Zealand or Australia. Then we've got folks over in Europe, you know, Sven over in uh, Norway and uh, a gentleman who's joining us from France. That it's not really possible necessarily to get all these people together uh, at one time without somebody being up, you know, in the stroke of midnight. But I certainly appreciate everybody's efforts. I do. A, uh, we've been doing a phone call the last two weeks with the East Coast. So it's here, Guam, uh, Hawaii, San Diego, and Bremerton, Washington, and then Norfolk and Broughton, Connecticut. So we got the fuzzy end of the lollipop. So it starts at 1 in the afternoon East Coast. So I'm up at 2.30 in the morning oh. for a phone call for work. Pretty good time. Yeah, pretty good time. <laughs> All right, guys. Right, it's going through like an instruction, so it's like not exactly exciting. I'm trying to stay yeah. awake. I come out to my shop so I don't disrupt my family. So I bring everything out here, bring my laptop and everything out here, and, and do that phone call in my shop. And typically, what I end up while they're guys will be arguing about stuff, you know, I put my stuff on mute and then I go work on uh, like the last time I, I did the 400 degree cure on uh, the, the five and a half that I have. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, our visitor from France is telling me that it's uh, almost eleven o'clock over there where he is, so it's 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 time to hit the sack. So, yeah, hey, what I really appreciate him visiting with us. That's uh, great to have him on board. He shared some information with me about his background, and I really look forward to hearing more from him. Uh, but hopefully, we can get him on a on the live Zoom chat with us as well. So, all right, you guys. Well, good seeing you, really. And Ron, uh, I look forward to actually seeing you. But it's always good to listen to you. Hopefully, I'll have a camera shortly. That'd be good, because then you can show us what that Japaning looks like, and maybe we can help you get over the hump and, and start having something you can put on the hand planes. Hey, that'd be cool. All right, guys. Well, everybody right. take care, and we'll see you next week. Send me some ideas. Okay, take Later. care. All right. All right, be safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye.